praise your name, Jesus. We praise your name, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, we magnify your name. We glorify you, King of kings. Oh, Jesus, oh, you are holy, holy, holy. Worthy, 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 Lord. Oh, Lord, we sing your praise. Oh, God, in the sanctuary, we will sing your praise, Lord, when we wait in the morning. Oh, Lord, we declare, we declare, we declare tonight that you alone are holy. You alone are holy, and you're worthy of our praise. So we glorify your name, Jesus. We glorify your name, Jesus. We glorify your name, God. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you. We praise you. We praise you, Lord God. We praise you. We praise you. We praise you, Jesus. Just begin to praise him. We worship you, God. We praise you. We praise your holy name. We glorify your name, Jesus. We praise you, God. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Jesus. We praise you. We praise you, Lord. We praise you. We praise you, God. There is none like you, Lord. We praise you, Jesus. We praise you, God. We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. We lift you high. We lift high the name of Jesus. The name, the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Lord, we worship you. We worship you, Lord. We give you all the glory. We give you all the glory, Jesus. We give you all the glory, Jesus. We give you all the glory, Jesus. Father, I pray that you take us beyond just singing songs. And you take us deep into the heart of worship, Lord. And what that means to come before you and praise you with everything in us. Help us to understand who you are, to be grateful. To have a deeper revelation, God, of what you've done for us. We just love you so much, Lord. And as we come before you tonight, Lord, Lord, take every part. All the good, all the bad. We declare that you are our God. You are our God. You are the one true God, the only God. And we worship you for who you are. For who you are, God.
is a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. And all the
We honor you tonight, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. You are a good, good Father. You are a good, good Father. Bless you, Jesus. Bless your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. We don't know how good you really are. We do not know how incredible you are. We do not know the depth of your love for us the way that we should. But Father, I know that as we continue to press into your presence, we are going to understand your goodness more than we ever have. Thank you. Thank you. And Father, may your goodness impact every person who comes here, even visitors. Those who are watching, may your goodness impact them as well. I'm glad that I serve a good God. I'm glad, Father, that you're not a God who is quick to anger and merciless. You're everything but. You are love. Thank you. And may your glory be strong and powerful and known in this place and wherever people watch. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, guys, thank you for being here tonight. Go ahead and find some people that look like they need to be greeted and greet them. Good evening, good evening. I didn't think it was that funny. All I said was good evening. <laughs> And they burst out into laughter. <laughs> well, thank you guys for being here tonight. Hope you all had a, a really good Thanksgiving. And um, slept off all the turkey. <laughs> but it, uh, it's good to be back home. We had a wonderful time. Wonderful trip. Very blessed. And uh, it, was, it was relaxing as well. Um, I don't know how many of you know Mary Corbett. She is a lady who attends the prayer center. And um, she was like a right-hand woman to them. She passed away this morning. Uh, I don't know her age. I'll say she was 55. She might have been 60. I mean, I'm not sure. Had battled cancer for quite a long time. In fact, according to the doctors, she should have been dead years ago. But she fought, and others fought with her. And uh, this morning, though, she, her body just quit. Couldn't take any more. She's with the Lord. Mary was a, um, such a blessing, and I so enjoyed seeing her whenever we would go to Tulsa. Didn't see her this time, and the reason was because Physically, she was unable to make it to any of the conference services this past October. Been praying for her and so forth, and a lot of people have, but, um, you know, we're in a battle. We're in a battle. And the truth is, the battle is being fought on two fronts. One is 
whatever attack Satan directs toward us. And the other would be the ravages of the corruption released in Genesis chapter 3. It is a two-front battle. Even if Satan and all the demons were instantly vaporized, no longer existing, we would still be fighting the ravages of the corruption from Genesis chapter 3. So, uh, you know, I just praise God that, you know, we'll see here again. Then also, um, got news today that, um, trying to make sure I get the connection correct, and, and I'm not sure of this gal's last name, but Becca Williford's niece, I believe this is the correct connection, was shot. Um, and all I know is she was shot and is in the hospital. I don't know if it was, I don't, I don't know where she was shot. I, I just don't have any idea. I just heard about it today, so I don't know if it happened. I, I don't recall, I mean, it was yesterday, day before, or whatever, and maybe I was told and I just forgot. But anyway, what, uh, what I'd like to do right now is just pray for the friends and family of Mary Corbett and then also for Ashley, um, Becca's niece. So Father, we come before you right now and we thank you for Mary and we thank you for Ashley. We thank you, Father, for the blessing that Mary was to so many people and the way she helped. And Father, this is not your fault. You did not give Mary cancer. But I know that she's with you rejoicing. So, Father, please just minister your supernatural peace and comfort to the friends and family of Mary Corbett. And then I ask that you would raise up people within that ministry who would carry on the work that Mary did and be every bit as helpful as she was. Father, we lift up Ashley. I don't know her condition. You do. But the last I heard, she is in the hospital. So, Father, we pray healing over her. And we just call her healed and totally made whole. And most of all, Father, we ask that you fill, whether it's the hospital room or the emergency room or the maybe she's been released and she's back home, but wherever she is, fill that place with your presence. May it be so strong and so powerful and so overwhelming that, Father, she has... There's nothing in her that wants to do anything but serve Jesus Christ the rest of her life. And just ask that you would continue to guide all the medical staff attending to her and minister to the family, Father. Minister your presence to them as well. And may the result of this be a revival in that family. We thank you for it. We give you the praise for these things and we just call them done. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Now, this coming uh, Sunday is our Christmas banquet. That means there's going to be food. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's Sunday night. starts at 6. So you need to get here a little early so all the food can be set up. Um, there's a still sign-up sheet in the rear of the sanctuary. So that will take place, you know, instead of our regular Sunday night service, which means attendance should be really high. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever you substitute food for my preaching, then people show up. <laughs> that's okay, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, that's this coming Sunday night. Really looking forward to it. But uh, right after the service tonight, we need some help setting up more tables there in the fellowship hall. So it won't take very long. There are a lot of tables already set up. So right after the service tonight, we just need a few more tables set up downstairs. So, and these tables aren't really heavy, so anybody can go downstairs and help out. Really uh, appreciate that, and thank you ahead of time. And I also want to thank Kelly and, and uh, Barry for helping minister while I was gone, and everybody else, you know, uh, you guys do well when we're gone. Sometimes I think a little too well, but, <laughs> but no, it, we have peace about it, and uh, that is a blessing. You know, the, uh, the elections that we've had most recently have been unlike anything 
ever experienced in this country. Ever. And not just everything that led up to the elections, but what has happened after the elections. You know, it doesn't matter who you voted for. There was all this talk and all this pressure. Will Donald Trump accept the results of the election? Well, I'm guessing he is. <laughs> but you know, folks on the Democrat side were, you know, they're kind of making it sound like that Donald Trump was just going to be, you know, all kinds of mean and it, it was going to be really bad if, you know, when he loses. Well, now we see what's happened. And uh, he didn't lose. He won. But look who's pitching a fit. It's just absolutely amazing unto me. And, uh, but it's not just all of that, it's also a matter of how a lot of Christians are reacting. You know, uh, and, it, and again, it doesn't matter who you voted for, just observing what has happened after the election. I have never in my life seen a president, or no, a, a president-to-be, so criticized before he even takes the oath of office. He's not even the president yet. And they're already hammering him over policies. What policies? He's not even the president. It's just, it's weird. And then a college has banned the American flag because students were upset over Donald Trump being elected the president. Yes, there is lunacy in this in this nation we're what we're seeing has always well no not always what we're seeing is the fruit of what has been there god is showing us what he's been looking at for a long time the potential for this has always been there you know the liberals by the way, this is not a political sermon, all right? We're going to get into the word I'm leading into it. Just, you know, to put you at rest here. The liberals are okay as long as they get their way. But as soon as they don't, they pitch a fit like crazy. They create news. They create stories. Now, I'm not saying that conservatives don't do the same because they do. We'll get to that. But the liberals, the way they react, when they're told, no, you can't do that. It's like a bunch of little, spoiled, bratty children. It is incredible. Grown adults acting the way that people have acted. Uh, you know, you don't have to like the results of the election, but my goodness, the way folks are acting. But then when you think, well, I don't know what you've seen. But what I've seen, the reactions of people who call themselves Christians. In fact, the other day I unfriended somebody on Facebook. I could not believe... Bite your tongue now. <laughs> I couldn't believe the lack of intelligence being demonstrated. Now that's a nice way to put it. I, I, was, I just couldn't believe it and I thought, you know what, I've read this stuff from this person, over and over and over, that's it. I'm not, I'm not doing it, I'm not reading this anymore. As a person who professes Jesus Christ, and a lot of others do as well. And I was thinking about all of this the other day, and the Lord began helping me to understand that what He's doing is bringing to light Things, now listen to this, that we prayed for. But we didn't, we prayed for things to be right. You know what I'm talking, the believers, Christians. Well, the smart ones. <laughs> we prayed for things to be right. But we had in our minds how those prayers would be answered. But God has taken the prayers and he's answering them the way he knows is best. 
That's the part that throws us a curve. We think we know what is best, and our intentions are right, and our motives are pure. But when we pray, oh God, you know, fix, or change, or you know, whatever, a, a something, and He does, well, it doesn't always go the way that we thought it would. Now, what He's helped me to understand is that, you know, even in, uh, think of this, in the, the uh, when Donald Trump was running for president, and you had all these candidates, Republican candidates, and, and they, some of them were just really mean to him, and said terrible things about him. Um, and he, he was himself, and it didn't matter who he was talking about. He was, so, in other words, what I'm saying is, you can't say he singled out two or three or four people. No. <laughs> Everybody was fair game. And that's okay. I mean, anyway, that's okay. <laughs> but, the way that the, some of the Republican candidates just ripped him up one side down the other, and now they if I were a governor of a state and I trashed Donald Trump, I would be highly concerned about federal funding in the years to come. Do you understand what I mean? These guys are now having to tuck their tail between their leg and deal with this because <laughs> he is the president. Bottom line, well, he will be. Now, here's what's been happening. The Lord has been bringing to light things that we need to know. Things that we need to know about people. Things that we need to know about sitting politicians. Things we need to know about elected politicians to be. You understand what I mean by that? They haven't taken office yet, but they will. He's been bringing to light things about, um, well, just across the board, and in Christians as well. And what he's doing is he's answering the prayers of Christians who have prayed and asked God for, and let me put it in my words, okay, for His holiness to be restored in this nation. His glory to be restored, for righteousness to be restored, and, and on and on. Because, as He's answering those prayers, what fellowship hath light with darkness? The darkness is being exposed. And God is showing us, here's what you've been dealing with all along, and most of you had no clue. So, now that you see this, now let me again put it in my words, you have some politicians that need to be replaced in the next election as well. Some that you thought were on your side, but now you know they're not. You have some pastors that if it's not clear by now they're not really serving God, now you know. And you need, those of you in their churches, you need to get out. You have preachers that, not pastors, just you know whatever they call themselves, that you need to be wary of. I mean, on and on this is going. And he's showing this to us so that when the next elections come up, if we mess up again, I mean, we're going to reap what we've sown big time. Go ahead and turn over to Matthew 24, because all this is tying into where we're headed here. <clears throat> Every election, at least as long as I have been in what you might call full gospel or spirit-filled or charismatic circles, every election has, um, has had its share of prophets. And these prophets will stand up and they'll say, the Lord has spoken to me. And He has showed me that so-and-so is going to win the election. He spoke to me. He gave me a dream. He gave me a vision. He 
Um, he visited me. Jesus showed up in my living room and we had coffee and donuts and he told me all about it. Whatever. <laughs> You're always going to have these, these people, prophets, who come forth and they say these things. Well, just in the broad scope of it all, half of them are right and half of them are wrong. And that's why, for me personally, and I'm, I'm not saying this to be critical of people, of ministers, of prophets, whatever, but um, I, I don't put a whole lot of stock into anybody who starts prophesying so-and-so is going to win, so-and-so is going to win, because I know they have a 50% chance of being right no matter what happens. So I don't really listen to all of that. And what I find interesting is that when the election is over, who in the world goes back and starts saying, folks, I was wrong. I missed it. I prophesied error. I've never heard. Now, maybe somebody has. Maybe they, uh, folks have. Me, personally, I've never heard anyone stand up and say, I really didn't hear God. Or that vision was not really from God. Or that dream really wasn't from God. <laughs> what about the person that showed up in your living room with the donuts and the coffee? Who was that? Now, the donuts and the coffee thing, you can throw that out. But when people start talking about having a visitation from the Lord. But yet, people don't admit. No, I haven't heard people admit that they were wrong. That they missed it. But along with that, I have yet to see or hear of anything where Christians stand up and say, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, you told us that God told you such and such was going to happen in the election. It didn't happen. You explain yourself. You explain yourself. Now, somebody might think, well, boy, that, you know, that'd be kind of mean. I mean, just, you know, why that might embarrass them. <laughs> let, me, let me help you out here. They're already embarrassed because they told everybody and their brother, so-and-so is going to win. In this particular election, Hillary Clinton's going to win. Now, again, guys, I'm not trying to be mean to people. What I'm saying is, I'm leading into what we're going to cover tonight. Too many prophets are not prophets, but whether they are or they aren't, too many people who operate in the, quote, prophetic, are not held accountable for their error, and in some, case, some cases, their stupidity. Now, I have a teaching series entitled Prophets and Prophecy, where I go into great detail about the ministry of the prophet and what to look for, so on and so forth. Get that series and listen to it. But tonight we're going to be very focused on, on something along those lines. In Matthew 24, in uh, verse 3, it says that you know Jesus, he sat upon the <coughs> Mount of Olives. The disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Take heed that no man deceive you. Alright. This verse, relative to the elections, I have no idea what the answer would be to this, but how many Christians jumped on the bandwagon of prophet this or prophetess that who prophesied that Hillary Clinton was going to win the election. And they, again, a figure of speech here, they mortgaged the farm on that prophecy. Now again, that's a figure of speech, but you understand the concept. He says, take heed that no man deceive you. How can I avoid being deceived? By taking heed. Now, since this is Jesus speaking, the taking heed has to be relative to who I am in Christ. Meaning, 
Become spiritually sensitive, if you will, so that you're not deceived. And he continues and says, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Well, this doesn't, it's not simply a matter of, look at me, I am the Christ. No, it, it really is talking about, they'll come in my name and tell you I am of Christ. Which, being very narrowly focused, relative to this recent election, people were saying something like, Jesus has shown me. In other words, I am of Christ telling you what he said to me. <clears throat> then if you jump down to verse 11, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Then if you jump to verse 24, for there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So what's going to happen? If you are one of the very elect in the body of Christ, you say, well, what is a very elect? The people who are of, of repute, the people who are known, the people whose names, you know, we can stand up here and drop some very popular names. People in the body of Christ who seem to be somewhat among us. But even those who are spiritually mature. Because he says here, if it's possible for these people to be deceived, then they're going to be deceived. Now there's a message in this message. Because he says, if it's possible, even the very elect shall be deceived. Well, if it's possible for the very elect to be deceived, for crying out loud, what about the rest of us non-very elect? We also could be deceived if we're deceivable. So let me kind of paraphrase this for the sake of this teaching. There shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that, if possible, anyone in the body of Christ who can be deceived shall be deceived. Now that's pretty much the summary of what he's talking about here. The emphasis is on false prophets. And he says they're going to arise. Well, I don't know about you, but they're all over the place. They're all over the place. They're prophets. Not necessarily false prophets, but they're in the bunch. Because when you say, well, prophets are rising up, well, that would include the real and the, the false. But in this, he says, false prophets shall rise. When I was um, growing up in church, we were taught, you must be born again in order to go to heaven. You, you know, you don't want to go to hell, do you? No, well, you better get born again. Put your faith in Jesus. Okay. Well, we were also taught that the ministry of the prophet was no longer for today. Well, neither is the ministry of the apostle. You know, pastors are okay, evangelists are okay, teachers are, are okay, we put them in a Sunday school class. But the apostle and the prophet, now, we don't have those anymore. But Jesus says that false prophets are going to rise and deceive many, even the very elect, if it's possible. This means that the ministry of the prophet is for today. Because the question put to Jesus was this. What's the sign of the end of the world? What's the sign of your return? So Jesus, in giving this answer, was looking beyond the cross into the future. And we are living in that future. This means the ministry of the prophet is still for today. How do we know? Because if the ministry of the prophet were not for today, then anybody who stands up and calls himself a prophet is going to be shut down immediately. Because that ministry does not exist. Well, the ministry does exist. And that's why there are going to be a lot of people deceived. If that ministry still exists, exists, 
it means that right along with the false, there will be the genuine. So both are going to be in operation, well, now and up until the time when all this takes place, both will be in operation. But he's warning us about the false prophets. Now, I'm going to read some names to you. Elijah, Micaiah, Elisha, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Micah, Malachi. What do all those people have in common? They were prophets. And there are other prophets in the Old Testament as well. But they were all prophets. And if you go back and you read things that they said, they weren't always appreciated. Some of the things they said, it like it, it hit a nerve. And people weren't too happy about it. And in some cases, there would be other prophets who would try to discredit the voice of the Elijahs, Micaiahs, Elishas, Isaiahs, and so on and so forth. You would have the, 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 um, the Ezekiels would be outnumbered by these other guys. And these other guys would seem to know what they were talking about. And they would contradict what Jeremiah said, or what whoever said. Now, turn over to 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. Look here in verse 1. It says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew or rain these years, but according to my word. Well, that's the way it went. Now, we're not going to read any more here beyond this verse, but, you know, Elijah the Tishbite. <laughs> you know, what does a Tishbite? Whatever he puts in his mouth. Ha, ha, ha. Who knows? <laughs> a little prophetic humor there. No, Brother Martin, that was pathetic humor. That wasn't prophetic. <laughs> anyway, Elijah the Tishbite, he's nowhere in Scripture until this verse. Where'd he come from? I don't, what is a Tishbite? Sounds like something from a Star Wars movie. <laughs> what is a Tishbite? Where do they come from? But here's Elijah, the Tishbite. And he shows up with a word from God. Well, Ahab didn't like it. In fact, there's a whole lot of people didn't like it. And if you continue to read the ministry of Elijah, there's another place where he shows up and Ahab says, huh, here he is, the one who troubles Israel. And Elijah said, hey, it ain't me that's troubling Israel. It's you, buddy. You're the one that's causing all these problems. And there were a lot of people who stood against Elijah. In another place, he stands before the people, Jews. And he says, now folks, you're going to have to make a decision. Are you going to serve the God of the Israelites, or are you going to serve the God of these false prophets over here? And the people just stood there looking at him. Didn't say a word. I think if I were Elijah, I would have been really upset. You know, seriously? You don't know who you're going to be serving? Come on. Well, you know what happened to sacrifice, the altar, the fire of God, and all this. Then the people decided, oh, we'll serve God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He seems to know what he's doing. <laughs> That's called a bailout. You know, oh God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway. Elijah, had we, we don't hear anything about him. We don't know where he's from. We don't know what a Tishbite is. We, don't, we, we know that he lives somewhere in Gilead. But all of a sudden this guy shows up with a word from God and he's contradicted by a whole lot of other people. People who are supposed to be prophets. He, he does not get the support of the very folks who should be supporting him. 
And see, those people knew that Ahab was bad. They knew it. But, for whatever their reasons, they decided, well, you know, we're going over here. We're, we're, we're going to follow this. Now look over in Amos chapter 3. Amos chapter 3. It's one of those little bitty books. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. Amos chapter 3. And we're going to begin reading here in, uh, well, let's pick up in verse 1. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth, therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Will a lion roar in the forest when he hath no prey? Will a young lion cry out of his den if he have taken nothing? Can a bird fall in a snare upon the earth where no gin is, is for him, no you know, bird trap? Shall one take up a snare from the earth and have, not, have taken nothing at all? Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in the city and the Lord hath not done it? In other words, judgment. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. The lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? Now what we're seeing here, this has nothing to do with the law. It has everything to do with how God operates. And we're getting a revelation that God will do nothing, but he does reveal to prophets, his prophets, his servants, what he intends to do. And he says in verse 8, the lion hath roared, who will not fear? Now, let me just throw in some symbolism here. Jesus is referred to as the Lion of Judah. So we could say it kind of like this for emphasis <clears throat> relative to this teaching. God, Jesus, the Lion of Judah, has roared His truth. Who will not fear? Well, I can answer that. Lukewarm Christians and the lost, they're not going to fear. The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? He reveals a secret unto His servants, the prophets. You're going to be seeing, the closer we get to the return of Jesus, you're going to see an increasing emphasis on the ministry of the prophet. You say, well, how do you know that? Because it sets the stage for Matthew 24, for the false prophets to deceive people. So you're going to see an increasing emphasis on the ministry of the prophet. And it's going to be weird in some cases. It already is. It's just, you know, if you study the, the Bible, you don't see the prophets being as weird as what you see in people today. You know, they talk in cryptic terms. Well, now I do understand in the Old Testament a lot of prophecies that took some interpretation and some meditation. But some of this stuff today is just really weird what you hear. And uh, this, again, is setting the stage for the false prophets. What I find amazing is how so many Christians flock to these strangely acting people who may or may not be genuine prophets, but it's like folks are enamored by the odd. They, you know, just... And you guys know what I'm talking about. You don't have to be weird to be a prophet. In fact, the Holy Spirit's not going to lead anybody to be whacked out. Now here he says that God's going to reveal his secret, his will, his plans, things he's going to do. He's going to reveal it unto his servants. Well, see, if you're a false prophet, this is one verse you're going to use big time. And to support your strange things that you're saying. There are times when... Um, let me tell you something. A genuine prophet is not always going to have visions 
and dreams. Now, it will happen, but not always. And a lot of these people today want to make you think that they're having these visions all the time. Now, I know figuratively speaking all the time, having these, these dreams and so forth. But, in the Old Testament, the way God moved on the prophets had nothing to do with the structure of the law given to Israel. Now, this is important to remember. Because when you begin reading through the Old Testament, here's something you're going to see is very common. And the word of the Lord came unto, fill in the name of the prophet. Now, granted, there were visions and there were dreams. I, I totally acknowledge that. But you're going to see the word of the Lord came unto. The word of the Lord came unto. This is how prophets primarily receive their prophecies, if they're truly birthed of God. They'll have visions, they'll have dreams and so forth, but it's going to be the word of the Lord will come unto. Now I said that to say this. There have been several times in my ministry where the word of the Lord has come unto me, but I have not spoken it forth. Because there are some times when He impresses upon me to not speak it forth. Then there are times when I know if I do, well, it really goes back to timing. See, here's part of the problem, guys. And I feel safe in saying the word majority. The majority of the body of Christ does not know how to handle or receive genuine prophecy. They don't know how to receive it. And if it's something they disagree with, then immediately they call into question the individual who spoke it. Well, that's the same kind of thing that happened to Elijah, Elisha, (laughs) Amos, Joel, and on and on. The same kind of thing that happened. Now, over in um, Habakkuk, look over there in Habakkuk. So God, Habakkuk, keep turning toward the um, end of the Old Testament. It's right after Nahum. Habakkuk chapter 1. Um, one of the things about operating in the prophetic, the genuine, is that there, there will be a genuine humility, not a false humility in operation. There will be a boldness in speaking what is to be spoken. And at times that boldness can border on the obnoxious, but truth is truth. And if you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and see how Jesus interacted with people at times, when, when look, he stood up and he looks at the religious leaders in front of everybody and he calls them hypocrites, brood of vipers. But yet, that was an act of love. Well, an example today would be someone, you know, call them a prophet. They they give a prophetic word that is real. And then somebody wants to fuss about it. You know, well, I just don't, and I just don't. And it can get to the point where that prophet is going to look at that person and say, well, you know, if you don't don't want to agree with it, fine. You know, you can drop over dead and go to be with Jesus now. Now, that sounds like rude. (laughs) But, there are times when the word of the Lord goes forth in a prophetic manner and it can come across as being abrasive. But it's only going to be abrasive to the people who have something in them that needs to be dealt with. Now here in Habakkuk, um, just begin reading here in verse 1, chapter 1. The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. Now listen to what Habakkuk says. O Lord, how long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear? Anybody ever been like that before? (laughs) God, where are you? Are you not listening? I even cry out unto thee of violence and thou wilt not save. I tell you about all the bad stuff that's going on and you're not doing a thing. 
Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me. And there are that raise and there are that which or who you know raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slack, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. Can you see what he's doing here? He's saying, What's going on, God? You're not doing anything. What's the deal? You know, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. All right. He can, the whole, basically the whole first chapter is, you know, Habakkuk belly aching. <laughs> and uh, in chapter 2, he says, verse 1, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved now, I don't know about you, but it almost sounds to me like he's having regrets over everything he just said. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stand here and take it like a man. Well, verse 2, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Now we're going to stop right there. And if you continue reading in, in chapter 2, God is telling Habakkuk, basically, don't worry about it. I'm moving, you just don't see it. And God is explaining to Habakkuk, I haven't turned my back on you. You know, just be cool. <laughs> Take a deep breath. Write the vision. But the point I'm making is this. God is bringing things forth that are genuine, that are real. But a lot of Christians aren't receiving it. You know, years ago, I remember there was a, this, this prophet he wrote a book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in 1988. Now let's see, that's been, uh, let's see here, 20, well, yeah. it's been quite a few years. And uh, the, <laughs> that book sold like hotcakes. Well, the next year, he came out with another book and revised it, made it like 1989 or something like that. I miscalculated. Here's the real... Well... People were quitting their jobs, selling everything they had. There were people that had their pets put to sleep because, you know, I don't want them to starve to death. And, all, all, all. and uh, I mean, I knew a guy went in and told his boss, I won't be here on Monday. He said, well, why not? Well, the Lord's coming back. The Lord's coming back. Well, guess where he was on Monday? <laughs> Punching that time clock. The guy was wrong. And so have all the people, Ben, who said the Lord is coming back in such and such. Now there's one preacher and I'm thinking of right now, and I'm not going to say his name. He's on television. He's very popular. And he has made a lot of prophetic declarations that have not come true. Not the way he presented it. I personally, I think, I am trying to be nice. <laughs> I struggle greatly with the thought of listening to that man ever again. It's nothing personal against him, but this is a part of the deception. And here Habakkuk, he's complaining, and God says, look, when I give you a prophecy... It's going to come to pass. Maybe not the way you think, or in the time you think, but it is going to come to pass. So therefore, a lot of these prophetic words that we get, they don't always happen the way we think, but they do come to pass. You know, we've had, I remember one time, uh, it was years ago, where the Lord gave a prophecy. Let me tell you how, a little bit about how all this works. 
when the Lord begins to give a prophecy, a lot of times it's not word for word that the prophet is repeating. A lot of times what happens is God speaks the concept of the prophecy and then the prophet delivers it in his language, in his terminology. Now years ago that happened here and I delivered a word and said that, and I, I don't remember, in fact I just thought of this while standing here, I don't remember exactly how I said it, but it was something along the lines of in the next year there is going to be another major natural disaster, um, something, you know, however it was said. Well, I was kind of, um, when that was over, <laughs> I'm like, man, that was kind of bold. I mean, gee whiz. I started watching the news. I mean, every week I'm looking for something. And so, you know, a month goes by, two months, three, six, eight, nine, ten. Eleven months go by, twelve months go by, and it didn't happen. But in the thirteenth month, is when that massive tsunami hit, um, it was like Thailand or the Philippines or something like that, and I mean, it was horrific. So, I, if I missed it, I missed it by one month, but how I spoke it wasn't wrong. It, in other words, the prophecy was right, but how I delivered it did not bring enough clarity as far as a specific, exact time frame. Is this making sense to anybody but me? <laughs> I'm not even sure if it does to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> when prophets declare these things, they don't always happen the way that we think. You know, quite some time back, the Lord gave a prophecy here that there was coming a um, like a... a an upheaval in Washington, D.C., the likes of which this nation had never seen. And a lot of people thought that that was um, when, it, when Barack Obama came into, into office. I mean, I honestly thought, well, this is probably the fulfillment of that prophecy. But now, <laughs> I would have to say, I think we're seeing that prophecy come to pass right before our eyes. There is an upheaval taking place in Washington, D.C., the likes of which we've never seen. Never! And it's impacting the entire world. When I look over in Jeremiah 26, Jeremiah 26, and here in Jeremiah 26, begin in verse 1, In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, came this word, from the Lord to Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house, and speak unto all the cities of Judah, which come to worship. Now this is God telling Jeremiah what to do, and how Jeremiah is presenting it here in uh, this passage. Um, and to all the cities of Judah, which come to worship in the Lord's house, all the words that I command thee to speak unto them, diminish not a word. If so be, they will hearken, and turn every man from his evil way, that I may repent of me the evil... Uh, of the evil which I have uh, purposed to do unto them, or the judgment, because of the evil of their doings. And thou shalt say unto them. Now here's where we find out what Jeremiah was speaking to the people. Thus saith the Lord, If you will not hearken to me, to walk in my law which I have set before you, to hearken to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I sent unto you, both raising up early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened, then will I make this house like Shiloh and will make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. Now, I thought, well, what's Shiloh got to do with this? Well, Shiloh, if you remember, was the place where the ark, well, if you go back and read the story of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, and they went to, God, went to Shiloh to get the ark and so forth. Well, by the time this happened, this event we're reading about here, Shiloh had been devastated. So at one time, it had been a place where the ark of God had dwelled, but by now, it had been completely devastated. And he says, so I'm going to make this um, house like Shiloh. Well, verse 7, the priests, now look at this, the priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. Now it came to pass when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak unto all the people, that the priests and the prophets... And all the people took him, saying, 
Thou shalt surely die. Why hast thou prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without an inhabitant? And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. So here's Jeremiah all by his lonesome. I mean, God was with him, but, you know, all by his lonesome. Here are all the priests, the prophets, and the people. The priests, the prophets, and the people saying, This guy has missed it. Kill him. He's a false prophet. Take him out and stone him. Well, who was right and who was wrong? Jeremiah was right and the people were wrong. Now, if you study this, what Jeremiah prophesied, what he said was, if you people will do what is right and turn from your sin, judgment won't fall. The people did not want to turn from their sin. He wasn't simply saying God's going to destroy this city. He was saying, hey, all you have to do is what's right. Stop your evil. Stop your sin. The priests and the prophets should have said, he's right. There's sin and there's evil going on because of a transgression of what God has given to us. But they didn't do that. Instead, they said, who do you think you are? We're going to take you out and we're going to kill you. Now, what I have just read is symbolic of a lot of what's happening on Facebook. Put a genuine prophecy out there about God holding people accountable. Guess what? All of the, quote, priests and prophets and people are going to attack with a vengeance. It's happened over and over. This is one of the reasons why I leave Facebook alone when it comes to this kind of stuff. I don't put the prophecies out there. If somebody wants to take the prophecy and put it out, that's totally up to them. But, notice he said, God, God in verse 5 said, hearken to the words of my servants, the prophets. Which means that we, as again, this concept is true with or without the law given to Israel. Therefore, this instruction is for us today, that we are to hearken to the voice of the prophets. Now look over in Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. So we're supposed to hearken to the voice of the prophets, and yet Jesus warned us that false prophets were going to arise. And they were going to be so effective that even the people who are very highly esteemed in the body of Christ, if they can be deceived, they will be deceived. So if their deception is going to be that good and that effective, how in the world am I going to be able to differentiate between the real and the false? Well, we're going to read a passage that helps us understand what we're supposed to do. In, uh, in Hebrews chapter 5, he's, the writer's talking about Jesus. And he says, Of whom we have, verse 11, Of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. In other words, we'd like to teach this stuff to you, but you guys are dull of hearing, so even if we do deliver the truth to you, you're going to struggle accepting it. Because, verse 12, When the time ye ought to be teachers... Ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, meaning mature, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, where he says strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use, he's talking about those who have used, starting out with the milk, but graduating to the strong meat, <coughs> those who have used the Word of God to get their spiritual senses so sharpened that they can discern between good 
and evil. This is not discerning between, well, should I or should I not go out and get drunk? No. You don't need a whole lot of discernment to know, I mean, you shouldn't need a whole lot of discernment to know better. This is talking about, let me say it this way for the sake of this teaching, to discern between truth and deception. To discern between truth and deception. Now, we're not going to turn to it, but over in 1 John, when you read through the book of 1 John, you're going to see him talk about, uh, and he's actually making a reference to praying in tongues and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, about guarding ourselves against those who are deceiving. Those who claim to be of God, but really aren't. So as we are feeding on the Word of God, keeping it in context, not hop, skipping, and jumping from one passage to another, but leaving the Word of God in context, line upon line, precept upon precept, meditating in Scripture, what's happening is our spiritual senses are becoming exercised or sharpened to be able to discern the difference between truth and deception. Add to that praying in the Holy Spirit, and let me put it like this. Our senses are becoming sharpened like a two-edged sword. One edge being sharpened by a contextual use of the Word of God, the other edge being sharpened by the Holy Spirit as we pray in tongues. Now the reason I'm saying all of this, remember when we read over there about Elijah, and it said, Elijah the Tishbite? It's like, well, what is a Tishbite? Who is a Tishbite? You know, I never heard of such a thing. But yet, he, it's like he came out of nowhere. Nobody heard of him. Nobody Read, read the whole Bible up until that place. You don't see Elijah anywhere. And all of a sudden, there he is, declaring the Word of God and bringing about conviction. Well, the Lord impressed upon me that the closer we get to the return of Jesus... He is going to be raising up a lot of tish bites. People you don't know, you haven't heard of. Now, now we know Elijah, a lot of people knew who he was. We know that. But as far as Scripture is concerned, we have no clue until that passage. God is raising up tish bites. People who don't have a whole lot of previous fame. I can tell you, once that took place, once you know the whole thing of Elijah and <coughs> Ahab and that confrontation, his fame rose. <laughs> A whole lot more people knew about him. But these Tishbites are going to be declaring the word of God. They're going to be prophesying. Now, prophecy is not simply a matter of future events. It's also a declaration of the truth of God's word. Because a lot of the prophets, read about it in the Old Testament, they stood up and they said, Repent, repent, <laughs> repent. Well, the prophets are going to do the same thing today. But you're going to see an increase of the false prophets as well. Jesus said so. There will rise false prophets. So we're going to have the Matthew 24 false prophets rising while at the same time God is raising up the Tishbites. The problem we're going to have and I don't even really know if that's the best way to describe it, but the challenge. The challenge we're going to face, that's it, is have we exercised and sharpened our senses enough to discern the difference? And there are people out there right now, the body of Christ should be turning their backs on, but they're not. They're embracing this stuff. They're defending it. They're saying it's a... God, and, and it's not of God. The, and, and another aspect of this is, when you hear a prophecy, don't just assume you are discerning. Pray about it. Ask God to help you understand what you've just heard. And don't be so quick to judge. There are words that the Lord has given through me in the past and I know that there are people who have dismissed them. And, you know, I've, I've made reference to this before, but 
one of the most dramatic. I hadn't been here that long as the pastor. And um, the Lord gave a word. It was a stern warning to somebody. You, you know, basically the word was, you know, if you don't get it right, repent, make things right with God right now, then, I mean, you're going to die. And the person that God was speaking to was here that day and even told somebody that was for me. And they did not repent. They did not make it right. 30 days later, they dropped over dead in the front yard. Just boom. And they were young. We weren't talking to some old person. They were young. person just, bam, dropped over dead. Now, can, can a prophet miss it? Yes, a prophet can miss it. But, that's not going to be very common. A genuine prophet. That's one of the reasons why when the Lord speaks to me, I tend to be very cautious about what I say. And pray about what I'm hearing. And I will publicly admit to this, if I have missed it, it's by not delivering words that I was supposed to deliver because I thought it was me, my flesh, my imagination, instead of the Holy Spirit. So yes, I have probably missed it in that in the past. But the closer we get to the return of Jesus, the operation of the prophetic, the genuine and the false, are going to rise. And there's going to be conflict, and there's going to be contradiction. That is implied in Matthew 24. We must Guard ourselves. We must get into the Word because the Word is truth, the Word is life, the Word is light, the Word is alive. The more we get into the Word, the more we are going to have those senses exercised to discern right and wrong, good and evil, truth and deception. The more we pray in tongues, we increase our discernment. We've already... I, I, well, all I'm going to say is I know of people, personally know of people, who have been deceived. And I don't want to see that happen again. And so I'm encouraging you, take to heart what God has shown us in His Word tonight. Don't take this lightly. Do not assume, well, you know, we, we really study the Bible here, and Pastor Jim, he teaches the Bible, and we're taught about praying in tongues and all that, so you know, I'm pretty safe here. Well, there is some truth to that. There is some truth to that. But, don't assume you can't be deceived. Because the moment you assume you can't be deceived, <laughs> you've just been deceived. <laughs> so guys, listen. We need to keep pressing in and be ready for what Jesus told us is coming. Glory to God. Please stand. Thank you, Jesus. You know, it's funny how, well, I get a kick out of it. I get amused by it. When I'll be praying for people, and, uh, you know, it's not like I hear anything on the inside of me. And I say it like this, an impression, just to pray for something. So I pray for it. And I don't think any, I don't feel goosebumps. You know, some people talk about, hoo, hoo, hoo. Ooh, 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 you feel that? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Well, I've never ooh, 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 felt that. I've, it's never been like that for me, and uh, at least not in you know, prayer lines. You know, I've prayed for folks. One, I mean, more than once, pray, go up to start praying for somebody, and boom, they go down before I touch them. I'm thinking, now wait a minute, you got to let me touch you first before you fall down. <laughs> you know, that's between them and God. But when I pray for people, then afterward, they comment, "How did you know?" How did you know? You know, that was exactly what I was thinking about as I was driving to church tonight. How did you know? I don't know. I, I just, I don't know. Just was impressed to pray for you. And, uh, but it's neat when that happens because I know it's truly helping that individual. Anyway, praise God. Father, I thank you for the way that you've lined these things that we've seen in your word. You've lined them out. And there's even more than what we saw tonight. But Father, I'm asking you to really impress upon us the need to strengthen ourselves spiritually through the Word and praying in the Spirit so that we will be at that place of discerning the genuine and the false and that we will not get deceived. 
Help us, Father, to be (coughs) strong in you and in your love and not get over into criticism. That, Father, we would walk in love, yet when somebody's wrong, they're wrong. And I want to thank you for moving in our midst, not just here, but wherever people are watching. And I say, Father, may your truth be the sole foundation on which we stand. I bless you, Father. I love you. And I am so thankful for what you are doing here in our lives. Those here, those watching, wherever they are. Bless your holy name. You are a good, good Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And we thank you again for what you're doing in the the lives of the friends and family members of Mary Corbett and what you're doing in Ashley's life. Father, I thank you for your will being accomplished in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, guys, look, if you do have an offering tonight, please bring it up before you leave. Have a blessed remainder of this evening. And uh, uh, table set up downstairs. So it won't take long. And Sister Judy is going to help. Uh, she is the official, what are you? Table setup captain. Yeah. So anyway, uh, if you guys could all go down there and take instructions from Judy, she'll be nice, and we'll see you all on Sunday.